Inventor, author, independent scientist, James Lovelock works out of a barn-turned-laboratory in the English countryside. He's best known as the father of Gaia theory, the idea that all parts of our planet, living and non-living, form a complex interacting system like a single organism. His latest book depicts Gaia in peril. The Earth as we know it is vanishing, and this is James Lovelock's final warning. Jim, thanks very much for joining us. Um, it's a remarkable year for you because um, you'll have your 90th birthday and many happy returns, and you're also going to become a spaceman. How did you come to be a 90-year-old spaceman? <laughs> well, it was, it was rather funny, really. Uh, a friend of mine in America uh, sent me a, <laughs> an urgent message saying, Hey, do you know Richard Branson is going to be advertising biofuels under the title Gaia, Gaia <laughs> Biofuels for Virgin Airlines. And I thought, what? Can't do that. And so I sent him an email saying, uh, look, you can't do this. It's almost as bad as me uh, opening a chain of brothels and calling it Virgin. <laughs> <laughs> I got back the nicest reply from Richard Branson. He obviously found it very funny and said he had not the slightest intention of uh, sort of screwing up the Gaia name because he'd been a fan for donkey's years and then added, what would you think about having a trip into space uh, next year or sometime? Would you ever in your youth have thought I might want to be an astronaut one day? No, not, <laughs> in, not in my wildest dreams. I mean, so what a wonderful... <laughs> thing to happen when you're 90, do No, no. Terrific. But some, some people will say that it's a somewhat environmentally reckless thing to do, to burn lots of fuel to lift some people 100 kilometres up above the Earth. Well, anybody who says that, I think, well, either gra gravely misguided or else a damned hypocrite. Because <laughs> <laughs> if, if, yeah, if you gave them the chance then, and they were of that inclination, they'd take it. But uh, on a sad note, I mean, your, your current book is extremely pessimistic, I think, about, about where the planet is going because of the carbon crisis, the climate crisis, um, what you call global heating, which is a much tougher term than global warming. Do you think that in, in 90 years' time, at the end of the 21st century, do you think there'll still be people going into space? I think it's very unlikely. You think we're going to lose that sort of technological capability? I think we'd be far too busy surviving to have the time or the money or the energy to do it. And it won't be considered that important then. So do you think you may be one of the last spacemen? It's a possibility. But uh, I don't think the um, tough times are coming next year or in the next ten years even. I think it's a little further down the track. But when it comes, I suspect it'll be very rapid indeed. One of the things I found interesting about the modelling work you talk about in the book is that um, it's the opposite of looking darkest just before the dawn. It might look brightest just before the exactly. fall of night. Because you say that it may look as though the biological systems are doing most just before they effectively conk out. Absolutely. And the reason for this is quite simple. Uh, as soon as the system grows unstable, it goes into positive feedback. And uh, the... It, as the positive feedback strengthens, then any small perturbation in either direction gets amplified. Mm -hmm. So a tendency to cooling will give you a real cold winter, and a tendency towards heating a real hot summer until finally it goes flip so, right the way up to its hot state. So when some people look at, the, look at the cold weather this winter and say, oh, maybe not so much then, you look at it and say, more extremes because the system is becoming stressed and more sensitive. Yes. So you were saying about the fact that scientists work in an institutional setting, in a political setting. You, of course, famously don't. Um, you became an independent scientist. But I have scientist. done. I, I know, but you became an independent scientist, what, about half your life ago? Uh, yes, it would be in 1964. And okay. that's clearly worked out very well for you. Do you think people like, well, Richard Branson or Bill Gates or the boys at Google, would you say what you should do is just set some money on some people so they can go out and be independent scientists? No, that's the last thing to do. Uh, give them a big pot of money and they'll just go and have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> or worse. If but they're... you've had a good time. <laughs> well, I know, but it, it wasn't just by spending money. Mm -hmm. I, I, I spent my last three years 
as a, a, a full professor at Baylor College of Medicine, mm -hmm. uh, with an enormous salary. Which is in Texas, yes? Texas, yes. yes. But the, the awful thing was that I had an almost unlimited pot of money mm -hmm. to spend on equipment. Mm -hmm. And they were the three most unproductive years of my life. <laughs> it, they just bought larger and larger and more exciting pieces of gear, and then spent all our time playing with them. <laughs> and it only dawned on me towards the end of that period that, of course, they were about five years out of date. Mm -hmm. The inventions on which they were based take that time to reach the, even the forefront of the manufacturer's sale. So if you just go out and invent something simple, you, you're naturally miles ahead of the game. And this was one of the impetuses that drove me to going into independence. Do you still tinker with things in your workshop? Oh, you bet. <laughs> Interesting, you planted, what, about 20,000 trees, yeah. about 20 Not years Not personally. Ago? No, no. <laughs> Only planted, I suppose, about a oh, thousand or so. And that was quite enough. It gives me all sorts of carbon trading bonus points. Oh, you should definitely cash in. And that, that pays for my trip into space more that, than over. You now think you should just let that land grow back into scrub and wood? Absolutely. You see, this is the trouble with not only the climate science, but also green philosophy and green action. They theorise all the time and never do experiments. Now, people seem to have forgotten that experiment and observation are at least half of science, mm -hmm. and it's being neglected. And this is an example. It, it, they say, isn't it good to plant trees? Have they tried it? Mm -hmm. Well, when you do try it, you soon find out it isn't a good idea at all. And the reason it isn't is that you can't plant an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. An ecosystem contains everything from bacteria up through um, um, amoebae, nematodes, insects, invertebrates, all the way up to giant trees. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't plant that. No way. It has to come naturally. And much more important than that, as the climate changes, as it is now, the ecosystem adapts beautifully. Mm -hmm. The plantations don't. As soon as the climate becomes unfavorable, they die. You talk in the book, as I said, it, it, it is in some ways, I think, a pessimistic book, which is not necessarily to say an unrealistic book, about a vastly decreased human population. But you also say that one thing that we should be considering as a possible counterweight to that, geoengineering, about ways of taking the edge off the temperature cre increases, the heating that, uh, that we see going on around us. It seems to me you have a slightly ambivalent attitude to geoengineering. Well, Oliver, we're all a bit ambivalent. Mm -hmm. It's in our natures. And uh, I'm an inventor, and mm. that, that's very much my life. So naturally, I'm interested in geoengineering, and I think they're all things worth trying because they'll produce results mm -hmm. in the way of observations and that'll tell us more about the Earth. So it's worth it from that point of view. But the other thing is, I think as there is an outside chance that one procedure could really turn back the clock mm -hmm. on global warming, and that is burying carbon. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is to get every farmer everywhere to make a profit by turning all of his ag waste into char, mm -hmm. and burying it or dropping it in the sea, doesn't matter which, mm -hmm. because p char is not only resistant to atmospheric oxidation, it's non-biodegradable mm -hmm. too, so it'll just stay there. But overall, Jim, I, I, what, what I find slightly puzzling about your book, given how engaged with the world you are, there's a certain sanguine approach to thinking of, in your ideas, billions of people dying. And I, is it just because it's just too vast a thought to, to expend compassion? I, I'd like to push you a little bit on that. Well, please do. No, it, it, it's a thing that's concerned me deeply. Uh, obviously, it has to. But then, on the other hand, I think it's part of human nature, at least it used to be when I was young. If you heard there'd been a famine in China mm -hmm. and uh, a million people had died, mm -hmm. you cared about that less than if your dog had died. Mm -hmm. And it's just, we don't get all that steamed up about mm -hmm. um, people who are not familiar to us. Mm -hmm. But it happens, and it's mm -hmm. happened. And don't forget that in the Earth's history, uh, while humans have been on, on the planet, that's about a million mm -hmm. years, there have been seven major climate events of this kind. Mm -hmm. And I think the geneticists say that at one of those events, we were reduced to a mere mm -hmm. 2,000 individuals, the mm -hmm. bottleneck 
um, genetic bottleneck. Um, if that's true, then they are very violent events indeed. Mm -hmm. And the one up ahead looks every bit as violent, if not more so, than the ones that have happened in the past. So I may be underestimating the death toll, not overestimating. Despite this accepting this terrible death toll, this ter terrible dieback, you're also, in an odd way, I feel, more positive about humans and their relationship to Gaia than you have been sometimes in the past. I mean, you think humans really do add something to the planet. No, not yet. Early on in the evolution of life on Earth, as is so beautifully described in your book, Oliver, <laughs> Eating the Sun, um, photosynthesizers appeared with this remarkable capacity to split water uh, using sunlight and a quite complicated series of biochemical reactions, and they flourished. But their waste product oxygen was in those times not a very nice gas to put out. In many ways about as nasty as something producing chlorine, no. But we all got used to it. Uh, I think that we are like humans, just like those photosynthesizers at the beginning. We've discovered intelligence, if you like, or acquired it, but we have it. And it's a very powerful capacity communicating intelligence, and it's enabled us through in industrial development and inventions to do all sorts of earth-shaking things. And many of them are damaging, just as oxygen was. But I think that the system will adapt, mm -hmm. and that there is a possibility that humans have a huge future, because they are as desirable to the planet in many ways as the photosynthesizers mm -hmm. were. So there are descendants way down the tracks. Could be the kind of uh, animals that make the whole planet intelligent and possibly extend its lifespan significantly. Do you have any hope that we could actually short-circuit short the system and get wise and thoughtful without the suffering? Well, I've thought about this a great deal, Oliver, and it might be possible if by some exceedingly illegal and amoral uh, kind of setup, you, you selected the, the best or what you thought were the best of humans at the moment and form them into a small society somewhere, that you might be able to dream up ways of, of uh, doing these things and doing it now. But we can't do that for all sorts of reasons. And we are what we are. We're the, the average. And intelligence varies as much as height does. But uh, with what little intelligence we have now, we can look back on the planet and we can send people who look back on the planet up in spacecraft after their 90th birthdays. And that's exactly. Some sort of exactly. Well, it's something we can do. <laughs> Jim, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you, Anna, for, for some very nice questions.